Hello, I'm Dr. Hafsa. In the previous video, we gained insight into the basics of bowel obstruction. Now, let's delve into the diagnostic imaging and management of it. To help us diagnose a case properly, we know how helpful diagnostic imaging is. So if we get an erect chest x-ray done, we can find free air under diaphragm as seen over here. Now here we can see multiple air fluid levels which can be seen with the help of this line. This line separates the air from the fluid. And it is normal for a person to have air fluid levels in their intestines, but if they are more than three, this is abnormal and it indicates intestinal obstruction. If we get a supine abdominal x-ray done, we can see dilatation of the bubble loops with or without air fluid levels. This is a normal AXR, whereas this is an abnormal AXR. This shows here an air fluid level and enlarged bowel. Basically, this intestinal loop over here is quite enlarged and we can see multiple points where there is a lot of air inside the intestine. This indicates intestinal obstruction. Here we can clearly see the difference between a small and a large bowel obstruction on the basis of abdominal x-ray. In small bowel obstruction, the loop is dilated more than 3 cm but not more than 6 or 9 cm as it is in the case of large bowel obstruction. The location is generally central and we see valvular condiment. These are lines that extend um, from wall to wall and completely cross the bowel as we can see over here. The large bowel obstruction is generally peripheral in location. It has hostile lines visible. These lines do not completely cross the bowel. As we can see over here, this is the site of obstruction. And there is the loop of sigmoid colon that is dilated. Now, if we get a CT scan done, it is performed with the help of oral or IV contrast. As we can see in the picture here, the loops of the bowel are dilated. And we can also see a transition point where the diameter of the bowel changes, indicating any kind of obstruction. Here we can see a non-linear boundary, which indicates a small bowel obstruction, like we discussed about the air fluid levels in which there was a linear boundary. Coming on to the management of intestinal obstruction, we generally started off with a conservative treatment by keeping the patient nil per oral. We give him IV fluids according to the clinical and biochemical criteria. We catheterize the patient. We perform the nasogastric decompression with the help of a Riles or a Salem stew and with 4 hourly aspiration. We check his temperature, pulse and respiratory rate 2 hourly. We perform the abdominal examination 8 hourly and we give him broad spectrum antibiotics early to reduce the bacterial overgrowth. Some cases will settle by using this conservative regimen, others may require surgery. The surgery should be delayed until the resuscitation is complete unless there are signs of strangulation or evidence of a closed loop obstruction. The signs of strangulation include vomiting, absolute constipation or the pain may become worse. The cases that show reasons for delay should be monitored for 72 hours in hope of spontaneous resolution. There's a famous phrase that the sun should not both rise and set in cases of unrelieved obstruction, which emphasizes that how important it is to treat the patient surgically in cases of unrelieved obstruction. So when do you know that the patient needs to be operated? In cases of failure of conservative management, when there is a tender and irreducible hernia, or in the cases of strangulation as we discussed before, the type of surgical procedure depends upon the cause of obstruction and once the obstruction is relieved, the bowel is inspected for its viability and if it's not viable, resection is required. Here we can see how a non-viable bowel looks like. This bowel does not have luster, it will not have peristalsis, there will be loss of pulsations in the mesentery and the color of the bowel will change to a blackish brown color. 
have briefly described the operative management of small bowel obstruction. In cases of obstructed hernia, the constricting agent is divided, but it should not be done in cases of hernias involving the foramen of wind flow and periduodenal fossas, as the major vessels run at the edge of the constricting ring. In cases of gallstones, the proctomy is done, and bezoars are removed by open procedures. In cases of skirt circulates and worms, these are removed with the help of laparotomy, and sometimes it may also be possible to knead the mass into the cecum. Adhesions are preferably treated conservatively, but uh, in some cases, adhesiolysis is required, which is done laparoscopically, as shown over here. A laparoscopic shearer is used, which coagulates and divides the adhesions. The bands are generally divided in intersusception if the patient is a child, air or contrast enemas are given, whereas in adults, surgery is required. When the large bowel is obstructed, after full resuscitation, the abdomen is opened through a midline incision and the distension of the cecum confirms that the large bowel is involved. When a removable lesion is found in the cecum, ascending colon, hepatic flexure, or proximal part of the transverse colon, an emergency right hemicolectomy is done. For obstructing lesions of the left colon or the rectal sigmoid junction, an immediate resection is done. In cases of cecal volvulus, if it is found to be ischemic, resection is required, but if it is viable, it is reduced. Cecopexy is done in which a part of the cecum is sutured to the ascending colon under the flap of parietal peritoneum. In sigmoid volvulus, a flattest tube is inserted with the help of a flexible or a rigid sigmoidoscope to deflate the cut. This is left in place for 24 hours and a repeat x-ray is done. Whereas in elderly patients with comorbs, the options are to resect or to do a two-point fixation with uh, a combined endoscopic or percutaneous tube insertion. Lastly, let's see how to treat an adynamic obstruction. In cases of paralytic ileus, nasogastric decompression and restriction of oral intake is needed until the bowel sounds or the passage of flatus returns. Laparotomy is done if the bowel is inactive for more than seven days. In cases of pseudo obstruction, um, which is the dilatation of the bowel in absence of any anatomical obstruction, if it's a small bowel pseudo obstruction, the underlying disorder is corrected with the help of metapropamide or erythromycin. If it's a large intestinal pseudo obstruction or Ogilvy syndrome, after confirming the diagnosis, an anticholinesterase inhibitor like neostigmine is given, but if it's unsuccessful, colostomy may be needed. I would highly appreciate your feedback in the comments below. Let me know if you want me to make more videos on topics of your choice. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe.